Power 4 membership is now up to 68 as SMU, Cal, and Stanford joined the Atlantic Coast Conference. A straw poll on August 9th revealed an 11-4 vote in favor of expansion, falling one vote short of the required 80% in order to execute expansion. The four no votes were Florida State, Clemson, North Carolina, and NC State, so one of those four votes had a flip, and come the official vote on September 1st, NC State flipped, giving SMU, Cal, and Stanford the required 80% to join the league. There are both short-term and long-term reasons behind the expansion, but in the short term, it's a financial expansion. Cal, Stanford, and SMU's discounts create a new revenue pool, as Cal and Stanford start with 30% shares of media revenue in their first seven years, before bumping up to 70% year 8, 75% year 9, and full shares in year 10. Whereas SMU takes no media revenue for 9 years, SMU effectively serves as a liaison, helping subsidize Cal and Stanford's additions. This creates a new revenue pool of about $56 million via ESPN's $24 million Tier 1 Pro Rata, which times 3 additions comes out to be $72 million, then subtract the 30% shares for Cal and Stanford, and you're left with about $56 million. Some of that $56 million will be divided among the 15 members, while the rest will be put into a success initiative pool, helping create more revenue for Florida State, Clemson, etc. After that short-term cash infusion, this expansion served a long-term purpose as a proactive expansion for two reasons. First, the TV deal. ESPN can renegotiate the media rights deal if membership falls below 15. So it was smart to grab Cal, Stanford, and SMU now for insulation in case schools find a way around the GOR. It's better to add one G5 instead of four or two instead of five in case four or five schools defected when that day comes. Remember, Cal and Stanford are considered power five schools now, but if they were to play in a diminished Pac-12 for a number of years, when that day were to come, Cal and Stanford could then be considered G6 schools down the road. Secondly, there's the Cold War with the Big 12. The ACC needs security for a post-defection world, and they don't want to repeat the Pac-12's mistake of not expanding, where the Big 12 would then be picking apart the carcass after the Big 10 and SEC take their prizes. By adding security to the league now, the ACC increases the odds of schools staying in the ACC and not bolting for the Big 12 when uh, the Big 10 and SEC invasion day comes. There's also a football recruiting aspect to this expansion. Via the 24-7 composite database in the years 2022 and 2023, there are 871 four- or five-star recruits nationally. Texas was tied for first with Florida, accounting for 15% of those recruits, and California was fourth, accounting for 7.2%. Before SMU, Cal, and Stanford joined, the ACC only had three programs in a top six state. That fell short of seven in the SEC and five in the Big 12. However, after adding SMU, Cal, and Stanford, the ACC has now doubled the number of programs they have located in a top four state for football recruiting. The ACC now has six programs located in a top four state for football recruiting. That's more than the five in the Big 12, the four in the SEC, and the two in the Big 10. Now, of course, that doesn't guarantee any recruiting success, but it does improve the ACC's odds by having more exposure in those states. Academically, Stanford, Cal, and SMU were all acceptable options to ACC presidents. Of course, Stanford is one of the top universities in the world. They're number three in U.S. News, number two in Shanghai ARWU, AAU school. Cal Berkeley is also one of the top schools in the world, top 20 in U.S. News, number four in Shanghai ARWU, AAU school. And SMU undergraduate academics are very good. They're number 72 in U.S. News. Looking at athletic revenues, Sportico is the best database, but they only have public schools. And then uh, at the bottom is the Department of Education Equity and Athletics numbers that has both public and private schools. Stanford would be top five in athletic revenues in the ACC, while Cal would be middle of the pack. And SMU would be at the bottom, but remember they had G5 revenue streams and they were still pretty close to the ACC floor despite that. Looking at football expenses with the Sportico database in the top row, then the Department of Education, Equity, and Athletics in the second row, and then their rank in FBS using the Department of Education database in the third row. 
Cal and Stanford would both be middle of the pack in the ACC. SMU would actually be above the ACC four, despite G5 revenue streams. So once they get P4 revenue streams, their budgets will only rise. Now looking at men's basketball expenses, top row is Fortico, second row is the Department of Education, Equity, and Athletics, and then the bottom row is their Division I rank using the Department of Education database. SMU is above the ACC floor, which is pretty impressive given that, once again, they were in a G5 conference, while Cal and Stanford would be at the bottom of the ACC. Looking at 10-year Sagarin in football, Stanford was 30th in the country despite some lean years recently that would put them third in the ACC behind only Clemson and Florida State. Cal was slightly below the middle of the pack, and SMU was last. But remember, SMU had a lot of really bad years, 8, 9, 10 years ago. If this was a 7-year Sagarin or 5-year Sagarin, SMU would have fared much better. And that's an important distinction considering SMU's strength will be their NIL program, and NIL just started very recently. Looking at 10-year Ken Palm in men's basketball, SMU was 57th in Division I, which put them right in the middle of the ACC. Stanford was 66th, slightly below the middle of the ACC, and Cal was just above the bottom in 125th in Division I. There's also a student recruitment component to this expansion, and using the New York Times database, it is a little outdated from 2016, but this was the most comprehensive database I could find. Uh, this is the percentage of out-of-state college students exported by each state, and California was the number one state at 9.55%, while Texas was the number four state at 6.21%. Combined, California and Texas export 15% of the country's out-of-state college students. And now looking at alumni distribution using the Wall Street Journal's Where Graduates Move After College database, Notre Dame sends over 1% of their alumni to DFW in San Francisco. Boston College sends over 1% of their alumni to San Francisco. Syracuse sends over 1% of their alumni to San Francisco. Pitt sends over 1% of their alumni to San Francisco. Virginia sends over 1% of their alumni to DFW in San Francisco. Virginia Tech sends over 1% of their alumni to San Francisco. Wake Forest sends over 1% of their alumni to DFW or San Francisco. Duke sends over 1% of their alumni to DFW or San Francisco. North Carolina sends over 1% of their alumni to San Francisco. NC State sends over 1% of their alumni to San Francisco. Clemson does not. Georgia Tech sends over 1% of their alumni to DFW or San Francisco. Florida State sends over 1% of their alumni to DFW. Miami sends over 1% of their alumni to DFW or San Francisco. Louisville does not. So putting all that together, 12 of 15 ACC schools send over 1% of their alumni to the Bay Area, while 7 of 15 ACC schools send over 1% of their alumni to DFW. So increasing their presence in those regions increases the opportunity to re-engage alumni and build relationships that foster more donations and perhaps sending their kids to their schools as well. SMU may be coming from the G5 ranks, but SMU touts a $3.5 million NIL program where SMU gives each player $36,000 in addition to cost of attendance in football and men's basketball. And that will only become more critical as we progress through the NIL era. SMU's appeal to the ACC would include financial reasons. SMU is taking 0% media share for nine years, which helps create a new revenue pool for the ACC. Another reason is football recruiting. The state of Texas accounted for 15% of four or five star players in 2022 and 2023. Then there's demographics. The ACC establishes a toehold in the number four metropolitan area. Then there's SMU's wealth with their three and a half million dollar NIL program giving each football men's basketball player 36000 in addition to cost of attendance and all those billionaires on their board. Academically, SMU has a number 72 ranking in U.S. News, which means their undergraduate academics appeal to the ACC presidents. And then budget-wise, SMU's football budget and men's basketball budget were both above the ACC floor despite G5 revenue streams. Cal's appeal to the ACC, first, financially, Cal is taking a 30% media share for seven years, which helps create a new revenue pool for the ACC, thanks to ESPN's Pro Rata Tier 1 clause. 
Then there's the strategic security for the ACC, where ESPN can renegotiate if membership falls below 15, and it adds power conference schools now instead of G5s later. There's also academic prestige. Cal is the flagship of the number one state. They're an AAU school, and they're number four in ARWU, the Shanghai ranking. And then demographically, California is the number one state in population and the number one exporter of out-of-state college students. And 11 of 14, that should read 12 of 15, ACC schools send over 1% of their alumni to the Bay Area. And then football recruiting, California is the number four state. And budget-wise, Cal's athletic and football budgets were right near the ACC average. Stanford's appeal to the ACC would be much the same as Cal. Financially, they had a 30% media share for seven years via ESPN's Tier 1 Pro Rata Clause, which helps create a new revenue pool for the ACC. They provide strategic security for the ACC due to ESPN's ability to renegotiate the media rights deal if membership were to fall below 15. And they add a power conference school now to the ACC instead of G5s later. There's also the academic prestige component. Stanford's an AAU school, number three in U.S. News, number two in Shanghai. And demographically, California is the number one state in population and number one state for exporting out-of-state college students. And 11 of 14 schools that should read 12 of 15 said over 1% of their alumni to the Bay Area. And football recruiting-wise, California is the number four state. Budget-wise, Stanford's athletic budget is in the top third of the ACC. And football-wise, even in their recent down years, Stanford's 10-year Sagarin would still be third in the ACC, trailing only Florida State and Clemson. And to top it all off, it doesn't hurt when Condoleezza Rice is in your corner. An AEC official told Ross Dellinger, if I had Condi Rice in my camp, I'd use her too. Per Dellinger's article, Condoleezza Rice is especially integral, spending hours on phone calls with ACC officials in an attempt to convince them to change their minds. Rice and the athletic director take leading roles in Stanford's push for membership, given the school's unstable situation on the academic side. Condoleezza Rice is extremely respected, not only as a former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor, but she's also served on the CFP committee. Former coaches like uh, David Shaw, Tyrone Willingham, going back years, were quoted saying that Condoleezza Rice would have conversations with them about tactics and breaking down plays and X's and O's that they only have amongst their own coaches. Condoleezza Rice is one of those rare people who can speak the language of both the football coaches and then the other language with the university presidents as she used to be the provost of Stanford. So when you have someone with all these connections and all this credibility both on the football side and on the university president side, people will listen and she can get in the ear of the people in power, the people who matter, the university presidents. With the Pac-12 now down to the Pac-2, that leaves the question of NCAA tournament units. Here are the quotes from the NCAA's document. The first quote, if an institution leaves a conference to join another conference or becomes independent, while the former conference remains in operation, the units previously earned by the institution remain with the former conference. So this quote says that if Washington State and Oregon State stay in the Pac-12, they keep all Pac-12 NCAA tournament units. The second quote reads, if a conference notifies the NCAA that it has seized operations, each institution retains the units it earned in the basketball performance fund. So this means if Washington State and Oregon State leave the Pac-12, all Pac-12 NCAA tournament units revert to the schools that earn them. The third quote reads, during the two-year grace period, a conference will still accrue units and receive revenue distribution. So this means Washington State and Oregon State can technically stay in the Pac-12 Corps for two years during that two-year grace period and collect credits. Now the fourth quote reads, after the two-year grace period, if the conference still does not meet the active Division I multi-sport conference requirements, the remaining member institutions will retain the units they have earned. Units earned by an institution which had previously left the conference will revert to that institution if it is an independent or its new conference. So that means after the two-year grace period is up, if the Pac-12 were to not meet the active Division I multi-sport conference requirements, then the units would revert to the schools who earned them if the league was not rebuilt. The final quote reads, by the end of the two-year grace period, 
if the conference meets the Active Division I multi-sport conference requirements, it will maintain all the units earned by its member institutions over the six-year rolling period. So that means if the Pac-12 is kept alive, whether by FBS schools or non-FBS schools, units will stay with the Pac-12. So theoretically, the Pac-12 can be rebuilt with non-FBS schools, and then Washington State and Oregon State could play as independents in the interim or have a scheduling arrangement with the Mountain West, and they would still collect those units from the Pac-12. Now, how many NCAA tournament credits are in the Pac-12's war chest? There were only three in 2018, but it got bigger from there. There were seven in 2019, 19 in 2021, seven in 2022, seven in 2023, and then two be determined in 2024. So that's 40 units plus the 2024 units. And units are worth just above two million, and they are divided out over six years. So a little over 333,000 per year. So you can take roughly 333,000 or a little bit more than that, multiply it by the number of units over a six year rolling period, then divide it by two, and that's the amount Oregon State, Washington State each would be collecting for however long they would elect to remain in the Pac-12 if they decide to stay.